Marty Key with RJG. In today's video, we're going to talk to you a little bit about the two morphologies of thermoplastic material. But before we start on the two morphologies of thermoplastic material, we're going to give a brief introduction to the two types or the two families of plastics in general. So the first order or the first family of plastic is known as thermoset materials. So this encompasses materials like epoxies, LSR, which is popular, liquid silicone rubber, which is becoming more and more popular in the industry today. Uh, the second family is known as thermoplastic material. And under that thermoplastic branch, we've got materials like polycarbonate, uh, PVC, polypropylenes, polyethylenes. Um, major commodity materials in your engineer grade materials are for the most part underneath the thermoplastic family. So within that family of thermoplastic materials, we have a subset, two subsets, known as the morphology of the thermoplastic materials. So the first morphology that we'll talk about is amorphous materials, okay? The second material that we will talk about is known as semi-crystalline materials. Okay. So these materials are the things that separate them. <laughs> One of the things that separates them is just the general appearance of the two materials in their natural state. So let's take a look at those differences real quickly and then we'll come back and talk about why they have a difference in appearance. So the first thing that we want to do is take a look at the materials in their natural state. So we can tell a lot about the morphology of the material by simply looking at the material in its natural state or the way that it would arrive from the supplier. So the first material that we have on the left hand side right here is polycarbonate. And we can see that polycarbonate is relatively clear, it has a lot of clarity to it. If we take a look on the other hand or on the right hand side right here, we've got a bag of polypropylene, natural polypropylene. And you can tell in its natural state, it's more opaque, it's got a cloudiness to it. Uh, this particular grade of polypropylene uh, is almost uh, like a cloudy white. So, one morphology typically has a more clear color to it, and another morphology will have a cloudy or a opaque color to it. So now that we've seen these two materials in their natural state, Let's talk about why they both have the appearance that they do. So let's begin with the amorphous materials. When it comes to the amorphous material structure or its organization, it's very loose or very random. So if we were to use magnification and look at the structure or the orientation of the polymers within the material, we would see no real organization to a very random, loose structure. On contrast, the semi-crystalline it does have amorphous regions to it. That's where the term semi-crystalline comes from. We do have a few amorphous regions floating around inside of the polymer. But we also have areas of highly concentrated polymer organization like this that are contained within the material. So how does this relate to the clarity of the material? Well, whenever light tries to pass through the semi-crystalline and amorphous regions, we have two different things that happen. So because amorphous is very random in structure, when the light begins to pass through, there's really nothing there to stop it from going all the way through the material. So in most cases, in natural amorphous materials, they will be very clear. Where in contrast, semi-crystalline materials will have an opaque color or an opaque uh, kind of a cloudy haze to them because whenever the light tries to go through these very highly organized areas, the light gets refracted and it kind of bounces off of the, um, off these highly organized uh, structures right here, or these crystalline regions. Um, so this also affects the way that the materials melt. So if we look at amorphous materials, we can think of amorphous materials I'm kind of like butter. If we take butter and we set it out on a table and we walk out of the room, we may come back two hours later 
and it's a little bit of melted butter, a little bit of solid butter, kind of a transitional period. Well, you can think of amorphous material kind of like butter. It never truly melts 100%. It continues to get softer and softer and softer. But if we look at semi-crystalline materials, they have a very sharp melting point. So think of semi-crystalline materials kind of like ice. If we have ice, we leave it in a room, as long as it's above 32 degrees, we come back 30 minutes later, that ice has turned to water. Anything above that 32 degree point, it begins to instantly melt. Kind of the same way with crystalline regions. They have a point where they begin to heat up, they start to get soft, but as soon as they hit their melting point, they very rapidly turn from that liquid, that solid state into that liquid state. So we've looked at two pretty distinct features of these two materials. So the first one being the clarity of it, or the formation and how that effect, how that clarity is affected by the formation of the polymers themselves. Uh, the second thing that we've looked at is the melting point. So now let's take a few minutes and look at how these two materials act around chemicals and how they behave once they are introduced to certain types of chemicals. So now we're going to take a look at our two samples that we have and test how solvent resistant or how chemical resistant these two materials are. So in the first batch that we, ha we have right here, we've got some our two polypropylene bars, which are semi-crystalline materials. And over in this bin, we've got two polycarbonate bars, uh, which are amorphous materials. So we're going to take um, just some regular acetone, and we're going to dump, uh, fill the pan kind of full of acetone. And this is... Uh, kind of the working part of nail polish remover. Um, use it like thin epoxies and stuff like that. We're not gonna put a ton of it in there, just enough to cover it. And we're gonna let this set, um, both of these set for about 30 minutes. And then we'll come back and take a look at the results. So after 30 minutes, uh, we've got our polypropylene sample and our polycarbonate sample. Uh, the acetone's either been absorbed or is, m most of it's just evaporated away. Um, so we've got our polypropylene we'll take a look at first. Um, really no visual defects. We can kind of bend it. Um, when we look at the part, there's a little bit laying on top of it, but it hasn't really done anything to the finish of the part. Um, looks just about like it did whenever it came out of the molding machine. Okay. So now we take our polycarbonate part, and the first thing that we notice is kind of the discoloration and the fracturing inside of it. So the acetone has started to attack um, this polycarbonate bar that we have here. So now we'll test the strength of it. Um, so we've kind of seen how, uh, how flexible this is. We know that one of the things that that's kind of what it lacks and all we do if we just bend it, it immediately breaks at the points that it's fractured. Um, so if we take another one, we see a fracture right here and it typically breaks pretty easily at those points. So. When it comes to the chemical resistance of these two morphologies of plastics, we can see polypropylene or the semi-crystalline material are solvent resistant. So if we're thinking about things like we're going to make a container that's going to, hate, that's going to house a, a chemical. So just think of something like brake fluid or maybe even gasoline. We want to use like a semi-crystalline material. So if you think about gas cans, those are polypropylene, polyethylene, based um, containers so they can withhandle that material. If you look at materials that are amorphous, you have to be very um, careful with these types of materials and their interactions um, with those types of chemicals or those solvents. So we'll go back and take a look at a few more things um, that differentiate these two types of materials. So we've seen the difference in semi-crystalline and amorphous when it comes to their structure, their melting temperature, their general appearance, and also how they behave around solids. So now let's take a look at um, their durability or the, how, they're, how flexible they are. So we've got our polypropylene tinsel bar right here, used a lot for testing in the plastic industry. And in this hand, I've got a tinsel bar made out of polycarbonate. So again, we can see Polycarbonate is a much clearer material 
and our polypropylene material. So what I'm going to do here is simply just bend or flex this polypropylene. So you can see I can bend it just like this, back and forth, no real issues, no breaking, no tearing. The material looks relatively the same now as it did before I ever began to bend it. So we see a lot of flexibility, a lot of durability in the polypropylene material. Now we take our polycarbonate material, our amorphous material, and we do the same thing with it. So first of all, it's very hard to bend. And as it begins to bend, we can see that it doesn't want to go back to its natural state. But if we force it back to its natural state, we can see a lot of stress and a lot of tear within the tie bar. Or we can take the polypropylene and bend it several times with a lot of flexibility and durability to it. We take our polycarbonate or our amorphous material and we bend it several times and it's almost getting to the point where it'll eventually break. So this is something that must be considered whenever it comes to what application the material will be used for. If you know it's going to see a lot of flexibility, things like living hinges, um, it's going to see a lot of wear, a lot of bending. You've got to take that into account and decide, do I want to use a semi-crystalline material or do I want to use an amorphous material? There's certain design things that have to be taken into account. So the next thing that we want to look at is the shrinkage of the material. So to do that, we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to purge both materials out and have a little discussion about what's going on during the purging phase or the cooling phase of the material. So now that we've seen how these two materials behave during the cooling portion in a visual perspective, we want to see how that affects the quality aspect of the part, specifically the dimensional aspect. So we've got our polypropylene tensile bar and we've got our polycarbonate tensile bar. Now these bars were made 24 hours ago. So we're going to check the dimensions on them. They both came from the same mold. And we're going to see how that cooling rate or the forming of these crystalline regions affects the dimensions of these parts. So now we're going to look at how the cooling of the semi-crystalline and amorphous materials actually affects the dimensions. So as one cools, it's going to begin to form crystalline regions and those crystalline regions will induce a little more shrink. So the first thing we'll do is look at our polycarbonate material, uh, which we said is amorphous, and we're going to get a quick dimension reading on the overall length of the part. Um, so right now we are at 6.3235 inches long for the polycarbonate sample. Now again, these both came out of the same mold. Uh, we got our polypropylene, so we're going to measure that and it is at 0.62715. So we're right at about uh, 10 thou over. Um, so the polypropylene has shrank about 10 thou more than the polycarbonate sample has. So this has got to be taken into consideration when we talk about the design of the mold um, and what kind of dimensional criteria that we have, what kind of uh, how much shrinkage that we're going to have in order to be able to hold our tolerances. So we can see after 24 hours there's quite a bit of difference in the dimensions of these two parts. Even though they came out of the same mold, the polypropylene semi-crystalline material has a lot more shrinkage than the polycarbonate amorphous material. So this is something that has to be taken into consideration whenever it comes to part dimensions and the final quality criteria of the mold. Dimension, we know that amorphous materials are going to shrink a lot less. Semi-crystalline materials are going to have to, are going to shrink more. So more design considerations have to be taken in to compensate for the shrinkage of the semi-crystalline parts. So let's summarize everything that we've gone over so far and talk about the two differences between the morphologies of thermoplastic material. So whenever it comes to semi-crystalline material, 
they have a very organized structure where amorphous materials have very random structure. This is going to affect the general appearance of the material where semi is going to have an opaque appearance and amorphous is going to have a much more clear appearance. Other things that we can look at are the melting point. So we said semi crystalline material is going to have a very sharp melting point. It's kind of like ice. As soon as these ordered or random regions hit a point where they begin to melt and they go away, the material melts very rapidly. Where amorphous materials continues to get softer and softer and softer. We gave the analogy of butter right here. Also, whenever it comes to chemical resistance, we've seen that polypropylene or the semi-crystalline material is much more solvent resistant than the polycarbonate material. So that has to be taken into account the final application or the final use. If we know we're going to be in contact with some kind of solvent or chemical, we may want to look at a semi-crystalline material versus an amorphous material. Also, how are our dimensions going to be affected? We know that when these two materials cool, that the semi-crystalline material wants to go back to this random structure. Remember, during the melting phase, these random structures went away. But once we begin to cool back down, they want to start making this highly organized or highly, ran, highly concentrated areas again. So in doing that, that creates a lot of shrinkage inside of the plastic part itself. So we have to compensate for those. So there's a lot of different factors whenever it comes to amorphous and semi crystal material that must be taken into consideration before we go into producing a part in a manufacturing environment. We thank you for watching and hope you enjoyed the video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow RJG, RJG. Thank you.